Hello, everyone, and welcome into our Wednesday night Bible study as we continue our look at the book of Revelation that we started last week, and I think we got maybe three verses in, uh, talking about a few things. Now, um, you're going to see me glancing this way and that way a lot because I have a lot of notes tonight, and I have a confession to make that um, just getting kind of really excited studying this thing and, and all the... it. It's like when you just have something you just want to tell every little detail about. You know, you have a story, or you have, um, uh, you know, or you just know a lot about something. A lot of times, people, and I'm not saying I know a lot about anything. It's just like when you have a lot of information you want to give, and you don't really know how to parse it out correctly. That's kind of the problem I've run into. It's like, oh, I want to talk about this, and I want to make sure we get this in, and I want to make sure we get this in, and I want to make sure we talk about this, and we don't talk about this, and it's going to be, and so. Uh, just a lot of information I want to get in tonight uh, as we get in further into this book and um, and discuss it uh, and and we'll we'll be pretty information heavy tonight um, next week hopefully Lord willing next week we'll kind of get into more of a um, a devotional aspect uh, and I don't mean like a little snippet of a devotion but more of a a personal application, um, more doctrinal reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness type look at things, um, which we may get to. Look, we're we're trusting the Spirit. We're my preparation was all over the place, so I'm going to try not to be all over the place in in my presentation here as I was Sunday night with our discussion in Hezekiah. I feel like I've still got a mess to clean up from that. So um, so please bear with me as I try to make, make something coherent out of everything. And as we always want to do when we come together to study, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we love you and we're thankful for this means of communication with one another, that we're able to be able to study your word even when we're not able to be together. We pray for the time that we will be able to be together again, that you would provide wisdom as to how to continue this method of doing things so that those who aren't able to be with us that want to be will still be able to, to study together with us. We thank you for your blessings on this body and this congregation. We're, we're thankful that you are attentive to the needs that we have as a family. And, uh, and Lord, we do lift those needs up to you, the various members of our family um, struggling with different things. We think of Melody and Lauren. We think of um, Miss Kathy, and and we think of Justin's brother. We think of um, Donnie Penny and and Bill Champion and so many others, Lord, that we we have on our prayer list that we lift up to you. We we pray for those who haven't been able to be with us in months, you know, because of the the virus, Lord, and. And even though we've been coming back, they haven't been able to be back with us, even though they, I know they desperately miss us. And I think of Miss Joan and Miss Evie, and we think of uh, Rodney and Linda Shannon. And, and Lord, we, we just ask a special blessing on those and others who, who, who haven't been able to be back with us. And, and for, for whatever reason, Miss Nancy Peebles and Miss Janie King, Miss Dora Landers, and so many others, Lord, who, um, who, who are, homebound and, and not able to be here, we just we lift them up to you and ask that you would let them know just how much they, they would be reminded of the love that our church family has for them and, and that they would have a blessing from you in this time, Lord. We, we pray now as we turn our attention to your word that you, would, uh, that you would illuminate it for us and that we would be blessed through the study of your word as you've promised we would be and and I pray, Lord, that you would apply these things to our hearts and ultimately that you'd be glorified above all else, that you would be lifted up, that your name would be, that your name would be lifted up above all things. And uh, we're thankful for this time and for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we, um, as we come together here and, and get into this, last week we, we had a few things we looked at and discussed and um, we want to uh, we want to get back into those I, again. Remember, I told you I'd be looking around at a thousand different places. So um, we're talking tonight about a unique reunion. And that reunion would be between 
John and Jesus. Uh, not that, you know, Jesus' promise is when he, before he left, was I'll never leave you or forsake you. And, and Jesus keeps that promise by sending the Comforter, the Holy Spirit to us. And, and we, we are always with the Lord as his children, those of us who are saved are never absent from the presence of the Lord. He has, will never leave us or forsake us. And, um, but the idea of being physically in the presence of Jesus, uh, at the time John's writing Revelation, it's been 60 years uh, since, since he's seen face-to-face, as far as we know, Jesus. And, uh, and I say as far as we know because we don't know if he had any dreams or anything that just aren't privy to us. And I don't, look, I don't want to put anything add to the Scriptures. I'm just saying, according to the Word of God, the first time John has seen Jesus since he is sitting in heaven is here on the Isle of Patmos. Um, he is exiled by the uh, Roman governor or Roman emperor Domitian, or during the time of the Roman emperor Domitian, I believe I'm saying his name right. And um, and he's on the Isle of Patmos, which is off the coast of Turkey by about 30 miles, um, and it's off the coast of actually Greece. It's in the Aegean Sea, uh, about 130 miles, I think, as I, re- as I remember what I was looking at today. Uh, the island is a little bit smaller than St. Simon's Island here in Georgia. Um, it's about, St. Simon's is about 17 square miles. Uh, the, the Isle of Patmos is about 13 square miles. Um, it's about twice the size, a little more than twice the size of Jekyll Island, and just a little bit smaller than St. Simon's. So that so that kind of gives you an idea of of the size of it. There, there's, it's there today. You can visit it if you if there's no virus and um, and you've got the money to go. There's a monastery there. There's uh, you know it, it's a it's a bit of a vacation spot. A lot of people talk about how peaceful and beautiful it is there. So, I mean, it's there. You can look up pictures of it. It is. It's beautiful there. Um, so, but when John was there, it was it was a place that people were exiled to as prisoners and and meant to go there to die. Um, but John, just according to what we understand from church history, John outlived his stay of execution. And um, and when Domitian's uh, rule came to an end, um, John went back to Ephesus, and he's actually buried in Ephesus. Um, he goes there, and, and he lives out the rest of his days there in, in Ephesus. So anyhow, uh, John's there, and um, and we'll see what's going on with John when we get into the scriptures. But uh, well, you know what? Let's go ahead and do that. Let's go to the Word and um, and let's look and see what uh, what the Word says as far as um, as far as where we're at here in the Book of Revelation. We'll just read chapter one together. Uh, the Bible says the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to him to show his slaves or his servants what must quickly take place. He sent it and signified it through his angel to his slave John, who testified to God's word and to the testimony about Jesus Christ and all he saw. The one who reads this is blessed, and those who hear the word of, words of this prophecy and keep what is written are blessed because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is coming from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests, to his God and Father, the glory and dominion are his forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, including those who pierced him, and all the families of the earth will mourn over him, This is certain. Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is coming, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation, kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of God's word and the testimony about Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard a voice behind me like a trumpet saying, Write on a scroll. You, what you see, and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me, and when I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands, and among the lampstands, 
was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a long robe with a gold sash wrapped around his chest. His head and hair were like were white like wool, his white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand. A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at midday. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is, and what will take place after this. The secret of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands is this. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So as we get into further into chapter 1, we, we see this reunion take place, and it's a, it's a different Jesus than the Jesus we knew uh, when he walked the earth and had his earthly ministry. Jesus has, has, um, has taken on, I don't want to say he's taken on a new form, but he's, he's closer to what he was when he was transfigured back in Matthew chapter 17. And, uh, and, and we'll talk about a lot of that as we, as we move into to our study, but, but John recognizes him. John knows who he is, and, and John has the response that so often the disciples had when Jesus would do something like walk on the water or, or would, there was a storm or when, uh, when Jesus was risen and, and appeared among them, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. John was fearful, and Jesus, don't be afraid. This is, this is no time for fear. And, uh, and, and he gives a great testimony of himself, and we'll, as we move forward, we'll get into all of that. But um, just before we get into that, though, let's quickly do, let's by way of review, um, whoops, wrong, wrong one, let's, let's just do quickly by way of review, get into what we discussed uh, last week. Um, I have to, I'm moving all kinds of things around to get situated so I can make sure everything's working just right. Um, first of all, it's the revelation. It's singular. It's not, it's not a plural. And it was the revelation to Jesus from God who, who, and it was sent to John by his messenger. So we're not dealing with revelations, plural, as some people say. It's the revelation of Jesus given to him by God, uh, sent to John. Um, and so just keep, it's not a big deal. Just, just kind of keep it in mind. Um, and then we talked last week about to understand Revelation properly, we have to really lean on the, the Old Testament. It's the idea of the whole counsel of God. Um, when, when Paul was leaving Ephesus, I believe, in Acts 20, I don't have it pulled up right in front of me, he used that term, the whole counsel of God. He said, I, 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 my conscience is clear of anyone's blood because I've given you the whole counsel of God. And he was referring to not just uh, the matters that we would consider the Old Testament, but obviously to the gospel. And so when you, when you come to the scriptures, you need to understand that there's a, an overall view of what is the scriptures are about, and that is redemption. That is the work of Christ. That is who Christ is. And if you ever struggle with any scripture, um, if you're ever struggling with, uh, um, with w- in your own studies, a lot of times it helps to ask this question, what does this say about Jesus? What does this say about the work of Christ or God's plan for redemption? We have made Scripture about us. You know, I I even have a—and that's okay, you know, Scripture is there, and we keep coming back to this this verse, I know, but it seems pertinent here lately. 2 Corinthians 3.16, all Scripture is— inspired by God, and it's profitable for, uh, for, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, um, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So we are to use Scripture to be equipped and to be complete and to, and to know the truth and to walk in the truth and to, and to see where we need to be corrected and, and to make those corrections. But ultimately, Scripture is not about us. Scripture is not about me, and it's not about you. 
It is, it is valuable and it is profitable for us, but Scripture is about Jesus. Scripture is about Christ. It's, about the, uh, it's ultimately about God's plan of redemption for humanity. And so when we start talking about the whole counsel of God, that means we have to, even in the Old Testament, consider Christ. And when we come to the New Testament, we have to consider what went on in the Old Testament to get us to this point. And so with the book of Revelation, it's very Hebrew heavy. In other words, it's very Jewish in the way that it is it's structured and it's written and and it and it's communicated. And so we need to have an understanding of the Old Testament. In fact, uh, one scholar or one teacher said this, that there are, I think, like 400 verses in Revelation, give or take. I'm going to say give a little more than that, maybe four. I, look, don't hold me to this. Go count them. I think the number he said was 404. I haven't counted behind him, and I haven't done the full work to verify this statement. But within those 400-some verses are 800 references to Old Testament scriptures. So you're talking about roughly two Old Testament references per one scripture. Or in some instances, one scripture may actually be, you may be able to refer back to three or four different places in the Old Testament to, to kind of enhance what you're reading in the, in the book of Revelation. Um, so, it, in, so Revelation, in a sense, becomes a bit of a treasure hunt. To, to go throughout the whole of Scripture and see where these things are pulled from and then see even what is around those Scriptures. Just I'll be honest with you, just in preparing some stuff for tonight, we could really move very, very slowly through the book of Revelation and take all of those Scripture references to the Old Testament and actually do a study on those individual references, where they're at in Scripture, and like take, well, I'll show you later, but like, for example, there's some Scriptures we'll reference in Isaiah tonight, and we could take those Scriptures in Isaiah and what is around them and do a whole study on them tonight and say, oh, next week we'll come back and continue in Revelation. Um, that, that's, that's the type of treasure hunt you could go on. You could get lost in the Word of God, and what better place to get lost in than the Word of God? What better place to to end up taking hours and just losing hours and studying the Word of God? Um, We spend I spend hours watching a movie or a TV show or 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 reading something silliness, you know. But it but nothing is as fulfilling as when I look up and realize. My goodness, I've been lost in in just tracking down some of these things for a for a for an extended amount of time. And and nothing's more fun or fulfilling. And so I would say, you know, if you really want to have some fun, track down some of these references and see what's going on where the references are. You know, don't just go to the verse and say, Oh, I see the words here. What is happening in that chapter? What is happening in that section of scripture that that it would end up being referenced here. And how does the referencing here change your understanding of the Scripture there? So anyway, to understand Revelation properly, we've got to really lean on the Old Testament. There has to be an understanding of the Old Testament. And then finally, last week, we talked about the blessing to the reader in uh, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Um, the Word says there in Revelation 1, verse 3, uh, he talks about, um, and he says, uh, the one who reads this is blessed, and those who hear the word of this prophecy and keep what is written in it are blessed, because the time is near. Um, it, it's the idea of this book literally kind of saying to us, hey, read me. There's a blessing in reading me. There, the, if you read this, you're going to be blessed for having read this. I don't know that there's any other book in the Bible that says, hey, hey, look at me, look at me. Here's a blessing for you if you read this. Now, obviously, it's a blessing to read and study the Scriptures. But here, it actually says it for you. Like, it's got the boldness to say, check me out. So, And, and we talked about why it is a blessing, and part of it is because of that treasure hunt you do through the, uh, through the Old Testament uh, in, 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 in getting into that. So... 
before we move forward, I just want to point out a couple of points of interest, or really, I, I was going to do several things, but it turned into just this one thing tonight. The, the, no, we're going to we're going to pay a little bit of attention to the sevens throughout the book of Revelation. Um, I'll list a couple here for you. There's seven spirits. John mentions them in verse four of this chapter. It's mentioned again in three verse one, in chapter four verse five, in chapter five verse six. The seven spirits of God that are before the throne. There's seven lampstands here in this chapter in verse twelve. There's seven stars in verse 16. There are seven churches. We'll read about those in chapters 2 and 3. There are seven seals on a scroll in chapter 4 and following. There are seven trumpets that we are first introduced to or we get to in chapter 8. There are seven bowls of wrath that we get to in chapter 16. But then there's some even more subtle sevens. So there's a lot of sevens in this book, but there are even a few more subtle sevens, and, and I'm just going to give you three of them here. Um, the first being... There's seven features of Christ, uh, and we'll talk about those. Or in fact, let's let's talk about those right now. Um, go and in this passage of scripture, go down to uh, verse. Um, well, I have to find it now. Verse twelve. We'll start in verse twelve. Did I already see? I've I've lost. I'm sorry. I scrolled around like that. I apologize. I. I can't, I need one more screen in my, <laughs> to fully do everything I want to do. I need to get one more screen so I can kind of watch five things at one time. Um, all right, so here, here's what, in verse 12, John hears the voice of Jesus, and he says, write on a scroll, well, verse 11, he says, write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a long robe, and with a gold sash wrapped around his chest, his head, and hair. All right, so what we're talking about here are the seven features of Christ, not, not what he's wearing necessarily, not... Um, not well, these are all things doing, having to do with his actual physical body. All right, so there's seven things about his body listed here in um, in Revelation chapter one. The first being his head and hair. His head wool was were white like wool, white as snow. So you start there, and uh, and and I'll give you a script scripture reference. <clears throat> uh, is uh, is Daniel chapter seven? So you have his head and hair. That's one. His eyes, there's two, were like a fiery flame. You want to see more about that? Malachi chapter 3, verse 2 um, talks a little bit about that. In fact, Daniel 7, verse 9, and then in Daniel chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, the description of the person in Daniel chapter 10, verse 5 and 6, let me, let me bring me back up so we can have a talk. In Daniel chapter 7, he's talking about the Ancient of Days. We know that that is God, that is Christ. In, in Daniel chapter 10, he sees, a, he sees a person standing on the bank of the Tigris, and everyone else is scared, but they don't see what's going on. Daniel sees what's going on, and he becomes scared. He, becomes, he, he passes out, basically, in the presence of this person. And the descriptions, if you line up the descriptions side by side with what we're seeing here in the book of Revelation, you really think it's Jesus. But then there's some controversy because... Someone touches Daniel on the shoulder and says, I came to give you this message, but I was held up by the prince of Persia, and I had to call Michael to help me. Well, if the person Daniel sees on the riverbank is actually Jesus, he doesn't need any help. If that's the same person that touches his shoulder to wake him up. I, I don't know. It, you can, I, I feel like there's more than one or two people there eventually. Um, so it could be someone else, to, because he doesn't, the language doesn't seem to indicate that it was the person he saw that touched him on the shoulder. So I tend to lean in that he's seeing Jesus. Um, and, and, and he has a similar reaction to what Isaiah has when Isaiah sees the Lord and the train of his robe fills the temple. In Isaiah 6, he, just, he recognizes his own state and he becomes fearful for it. So anyway, back to the scriptures here. So one, his hair and head, white like wool, 
white as snow, eyes like a fiery flame. That's two. His feet were like fine bronze as in a furnace. And when you start talking about the feet um, and the bronze, that's the idea of judgment there and that sort of thing. Um, his voice was like the sound of cascading waters or many waters. I would point you to Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 2. Uh, he had a he had seven stars in his right hand. So, okay, let's go back over here. Head one, head and hair one, eyes two, feet three, voice four, seven stars in his right hand, five, double-edged sword coming from his mouth, six. Now, we know the double-edged sword coming from his mouth. When we hear double-edged sword, a lot of times we think of the Word of God as living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, so out of Hebrews, but also Isaiah 49, verse 2, and Isaiah 11, verse 4, um, talks about the judgment from his mouth and, and, uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. So that is six, is the mouth, and then his face, or his countenance, as the King James Version says, was shining like the sun at midday. So that's seven. So seven features of Christ his person, not what he was wearing and that sort of thing, but just his person uh, are, are mentioned in those two verses. You can take it or leave it. You can say, well, Steve, you know what? We need more than that because that was, you know, there are other things. So um, the uh, the seven doxologies in heaven. Now, the doxologies are these, these songs of worship that are sung uh, about the Lamb, about God, um, let's go over to Revelation 4 really quickly. Skip ahead to Revelation 4 just to kind of get a flavor so you know what we're talking about. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 9, um, it, it, says, it says this. Um, let me pull it up here so you can see with me. Revelation 4, verse 9, Whenever the creature, living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one uh, seated on the throne, worship the one who lives forever and ever, cast their crowns before the throne, and say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you've created all things, and because of your will they exist and were created. There are seven different doxologies like this throughout the, throughout the book of Revelation. And, um, and as it comes to this one, these things that they're attributing to God, uh, you're worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. I want to take you back now to Revelation verse 1, or Revelation chapter 1, rather, and, um, and look and uh, and see what John has to say uh, about him in verse six, or we'll start in verse uh, verse verse five. He says in the last part of verse five, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, the glory and dominion are his forever and ever. Amen. So John is attributing in his statement here glory and dominion in verse in chapter four, verse starting there in verse nine, as we saw, what they what the elders attribute to him are uh, in down in verse eleven are uh, glory, honor, and power. By the end of these things, it'll be blessing, honor, glory power, and two, and two or three, three more, because it, it, it really does end up in seven. It, it's, it's a pretty amazing thing, um, the, way that, the way that this ends up um, in, in a climax with, with sevens, and I, don't, I didn't have that one written down. It's just something that, that I remembered and, and just brought up, so I apologize for not having that written down in the notes. Again, so much information, you know, so many little things, and and just wanting you to kind of see this, and we'll talk about why this matters in a second, or or why it may matter. It may just be, I'm a, I'm a glutton for punishment for bringing these things up. 
And then there are seven blessings, um, that are, or you could call them beatitudes. They're found in, in, verse, in verse 3 of chapter 1, blessed are they that read the prophecy. And it's kind of a similar thing in chapter 22, verse 14, but all throughout there are different blessings on the on here or what we call beatitudes um, for uh, for in, in the uh, in the book I'm trying to really I had them written down somewhere that's not on the notes here that I wanted to uh, but I, I was going to look and see okay here we go um, verse one chapter one verse three are blessed are the ones that read and they that hear and keep the things. Verses chapter 14, verse 13 are blessed are those are the dead who die in the Lord. Chapter 16, verse 15 is um is blessed is he that watch and keeps uh, his garments. Uh verse 19 or chapter 19, verse 9, are blessed are the ones who called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Chapter 20, verse 6, are blessed and holy are, are, is the one that has a part in the first resurrection. Chapter 22, blessed is he that keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. In chapter 22, verse 14, or blessed are they that wash their robes. So you're talking about seven different blessings or beatitudes um, here. And so those things, like, they're not listed as like, and here are seven things. It, they're just, they're, they're subtle. They're, they're a little more subtle. They're a little, and if you pay attention to that stuff and you kind of count around, you, you may be surprised at just how many are are there it it's one of those exercises in studying to pay attention to see don't get too caught up in it but like if you if you notice something being repeated if you notice a grouping of things if you notice um you know something like that like there's a there's a there may be several characters or several people or several personages and you kind of notice that count them up and see if there's not seven, it may be, there may be not, but I think you'll be surprised that more often than not, you'll find these sevens are kind of tucked away, almost like a hidden Mickey at Disney World, if you know what I'm talking about with that, um, where where they will kind of hide the shape of Mickey's head in different places. So anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, so there's several elements of the, let, seven elements of the letters to the churches. Um, each church has and and here's and this is where it can get a little bit tricky because some churches don't have a couple and some yeah some are missing parts but overall there's seven parts to the letter there's the name of the church Jesus's title for himself there's a commendation um there is a um a a uh you need to do this better i forget, i can't think of the word for that so terrible. I'm a terrible teacher. Um, there is uh, a promise to the overcomer, um, and there is, again, I've got to find where I have it written down, and I'm sorry. This is terrible. This is a terrible thing that I've I've done here. We'll talk about it as we we'll, we'll talk about it as we get into the actual churches um, to to talk about what the sevens are in what the seven elements of those letters are. I'm a terrible, terrible teacher. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, but we'll, as we get into those, what, here we are. I found it. Thank you. Found it. There is the name of the church, the title of the cry of Christ that he gives himself. There's a commendation to the church. There's concerns that he has for the churches. There's the exhortation. In other words, do this to fix the concern there's the promise to the overcomer, and then there is the the final uh, sign off. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there's seven parts to each of the letters. Now some of the letters don't have those. Some don't have a commendation at all, and some don't have a concern. So, but in general, across the board, there's these seven elements, these seven churches. So there's there's that. Um, and uh, and I think that's the only other of the subtle sevens that I have. The subtle sevens, the new movie. Uh, anyhow, I, I need to stop playing around. Um, that's what I do when I feel like I've messed. So why seven? Well, from creation in the Hebrew culture, especially from creation, the number seven is identified with something being complete uh, or something being finished it, because on the seventh day, God rested. He ceased working on creation. 
And, um, and so it is from that point forward, it's identified with completeness, with holiness, with, with God. It becomes kind of a number for God. Um, Seven becomes the number of God, whereas six is the number of man, because man was created on the sixth day. And we'll see that come back into play in later on with the number six uh, in, in the book of Revelation. Um, so when you have all these sevens, it kind of becomes a fingerprint of God on the book to signify the completeness of the work that's described throughout. Now, there are things that are not written down. We'll, we'll have seven thunders that utter their voices, and John will go to write that down, and they'll say, no, don't write this down. Keep that sealed up. But the idea here being that when you get through with Revelation because of the completeness of what God is showing us, it fills in gaps that, that need to be filled in from Daniel, from Isaiah, from, from some of the other prophets, where God discusses the work of the Messiah in full as far as leading in, in his rule, his millennial rule, but there's all these other things that need these holes that need to be filled in, and, and God fills those in pretty solidly. Like, this is pretty definitively. So, so this kind of becomes his fingerprint or his signature, these sevens that are throughout, um, throughout this work. Uh, so here we go. Now, let's get back to the Scripture specifically. And, uh, and talk about where we see uh, what we see John in, in the way that in the way he writes his greeting here because there's something interesting here as, as John greets the churches. So he says here um, in verse four, he says, uh, again, uh, you see I'm moving things around because I need another I need one more I guess, I guess I need one more screen. I need I need a screen. I'll just tell you what's going on. I have a program where I can have all these things show up on the screen for you. And so what I need is a screen, and my lighting got weird. It looks strange all of a sudden. Um, what, what I, so I have a screen with that program on it, and then I have a place where my PowerPoint window is, and then I have a place where, like, the Scripture window is and everything. And so either I need to stop being lazy and not use the Scripture from the Internet and get it in the PowerPoint, or I need a new, or I need to just figure out a way to get a third screen up here. Anyhow, that's neither here nor there. John's greeting. I don't know why people put up with me. John says, to the seven churches in Asia. Now, Asia doesn't mean like the big continent as we know it today. This is the area that we would call Turkey um, around that general area today. And as we go through each of these churches, we'll actually pull up pictures on a map to show you where these places are were and some still are. Um, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is coming, from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Um, this is John's greeting to these churches. We will talk as we get to the churches, we'll talk about why these particular churches, um, what What's the point in, in writing to these churches specifically? Is there a reason to write to these churches specifically? Does it have some underlying meaning or message? And we'll talk about the views on that. Um, in fact, I doubt I even end up taking one viewpoint or another. I used to kind of do that, but the more I've, I've looked and studied and, and kind of, I'm not sure how I feel about that so much anymore. Um, but we'll talk about that as we get into it. We'll, we'll talk about different things, and, and I, may, I may come back around and be like, I do totally think this. We'll see. It's Anyway, grace and peace. These are concepts that without grace, you're not going to have peace. Um, and, and it's not just any grace. It's not grace that I can give you. It's not grace that you can show someone else to have peace. Grace will bring peace on a human level between each other for, you know, in an imperfect way for a limited amount of time. But because of God's grace, we have peace. We have perfect peace. We have the peace that passes all understanding because of our standing with God by His grace, because of our, um, because of our standing in eternity, because of His grace, we have peace. And, and, in, and in a time of turmoil and in times of trouble, 
where the world has no peace, and I don't mean just the absence of war, I mean where there's no serenity, there's no calmness, there's no stability, we have peace because of the grace that's been given to us. So grace and peace, these are these are big concepts. These are these are ideas worth stopping and talking about for weeks on end. Um, and he says, so, but this is also just a standard kind of greeting, grace and peace to you, you know, that kind of thing. So he, he says, grace and peace to you from the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is coming. What we're going to see here is the Trinity in its fullness in John's greeting. I think this is just really neat. Look at what he says here when he says to the one who is, uh, the who is who is who was and who is to come um in Exodus chapter 3 verse 14 you know what God says of himself God says tell them he says I am who I am when when Moses says when they when they asked me who sent me talking about Israel who should I say and he said I am who I am tell them I am has sent you Jesus says before Abraham was I am. This idea of I am is etern- eternality, constancy, that God is, he was, and he always will be, that God is past, present, and future, and he is who he is, and he's forever past, he's forever present, he's forever future, he is eternal. And so this is God the Father in his eternality that we're seeing here, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. But then we also see Jesus there in the next verse. Um, that's in verse 4. But in verse 5, he says, And from Jesus, blatantly from Jesus, God the Son, the faithful witness. Now, here's where it gets fun. In Psalm 89, verse 37, that term, faithful witness, is used to talk about the descendant of David who will be the faithful witness. Go, let's go there. Let's go to Psalm 89 and, uh, and, and down to verse 37. Where, where, where God is talking about um, this this one that that's coming. Um, it, it's wow. It, it's it's amazing. I want to read the whole thing, but I'm not. I'm not going. We don't have time to read all of Psalm 89. But I would, I would, uh, I would challenge you, or I would encourage you to go check out um, Psalm Psalm 189. And, uh, and and see what's there for you, as he says. But down in verse 37, he says, Like the moon established forever, a faithful witness in the sky, uh, Selah. He's saying, think about that. Consider that. That's what Selah means. Just think about that. Stop and think about that. It's a, it's a verbal pause that, that means to stop and think about what, what you've just seen. Um he, he, we'll go up to verse 35. He says, once and for all, I've sworn an oath by my holiness. I will not lie to David. His offspring will continue forever. His throne, like the sun before me, like the moon established forever, a faithful witness in the sky. So the idea here is the throne is going to be like the moon that is a faithful witness in the sky, but Jesus now is that faithful witness. Jesus has replaced these signs as the faithful witness. And, uh, and also, when you go to, like, the book of John, and he talks about testifying to himself and the Father testifying and his works testifying, he is the faithful witness. When you go to John chapter 18, verse 37, as Jesus is before Pilate, Jesus talks about the truth that he is and that he speaks. But then he says he's the ruler of the king. He's the firstborn of the dead. I'm sorry, let's go there first. The firstborn of the dead. Up in verse 27 of Psalm 89... Um, God says, I will make him my firstborn. And then look what he tacks on in verse 27. It says, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Look what it says here in Psalm uh, 89, verse 27. I will also make him my firstborn, greatest of the kings of the earth. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. In Psalm 136, verse 3, look what he says. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Look what he says in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. God talks of, of this. He says in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. Got a scroll there. I apologize. Lord, you've heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will listen. That's not the right. Oh, I'm back in Psalms. <laughs> I, I did Psalm 10. Sorry. 
Deuteronomy 10. There we go. Verse 17. I have to click the book as well as the chapter. I got excited. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great and mighty and awesome God, showing no partiality and taking no bribe. He is the, the ruler of the kings of the earth. And in Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, we'll see that he has a name written on his thigh. That no one knows that he is written as king of kings and the Lord of lords is what is written as his name, that he is that. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth, and, and that is who he is. But then we get this interesting, uh, this interesting turn of phrase where John talks about God, the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits before his throne. This could also be called the sevenfold spirit um, before his throne, and uh, and this this actually, you know, this is one of those things that if you're, it, it can it can catch you off guard um, if you're not careful, and you and you want to be careful to make sure that you're studying the Word of God to see exactly what is what is in view here. Um, Isaiah chapter eleven. It says, then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. This is talking about Jesus. And it says, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Now, the translators have done us a favor by capitalizing the S's here with the spirit of the Lord and then these other, because that lets us know we're still in the spirit of the Lord arena. Here. And you have the Spirit of the Lord, that's one, Spirit of Wisdom, two, Understanding, three, Spirit of Counsel, four, Strength, five, Spirit of Knowledge, six, Spirit of the Fear of the Lord, seven. Uh, a lot of commentators talk about this being the sevenfold Spirit of God, that that's what's in view here in Isaiah chapter 11, and that's what's in view later on in the book of Revelation as we get there. So in John's greeting, he evokes the full Trinity, the fullness of the Trinity of God. We'll talk a little bit more. Let's talk a little bit more about this idea of the Trinity because this is one of those things when we were doing our how we know what we can trust, what we believe, and we got into some of these other religions that don't believe in the Trinity, that don't believe in one God existing in three persons. When we got into that, my color shifted again. Um, when we got into that, uh, we find out that these other these other denom- these not denominations, these other religions who claim to follow Jesus, who claim to follow Jehovah, don't believe in the fullness of the Trinity in, in the in the one God existing in three persons. And so here in the book of Revelation, we are actually given this great um fun truth of this 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 statement in Revelation chapter 1 where we're at the first thing is as God says of himself um he says in verse 8 of Revelation 1 I am the alpha and omega and uh says the Lord the one who is the one who was and who is coming the almighty the idea of the alpha and omega being the beginning and the end then when you come down now, in the King James Version, in verse 11, it adds that I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, right on a scroll what you see. But that comes from a from, from a writing called the Textus Receptus, which this gets into all the how we got our Bible and everything. But it can't really be found on any of the ancient manuscripts we have from the, from the original language and everything. So in some of our in newer translations, that phrase gets left out of verse 11 just because it's not in... Um, the manuscripts that are used to translate nowadays. But it's definitely here, down in verse 17. Don't be afraid, I'm the first and last. The Alpha and Omega, the first and last, the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades, or death and hell. This is definitely Jesus. He's the first, he, he attributes to himself being the first and last. He does this again, in uh, in chapter 2, and then this phrase comes back up again, as well as the Alpha and Omega, later on. But now there's something interesting in view here. If we, uh, let me pull this slide back up for us. When you get to this idea of the first and last, 
Um, it's said by the Lord God in verse 8 that he's the Alpha and Omega. In other words, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Then it's said by Jesus here in verse 17, definitively said in verse 17. It may not be in verse 11, um, you know, originally, but it's definitely here in verse 17. But then in Isaiah chapter 41, in 44, and in Isaiah chapter 48, in those three places, God says of himself, I am the first and the last. This is God speaking. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4, he says, I, Yahweh, am the first and the last. I am he. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, he says, and I'm just going to read these to you while this is up here. This is what the Lord, the King of Israel and its Redeemer, the Lord of hosts says, I am the first and I am the last. There is no God but me. Now, we cannot be confused by those two verses at all, that this is the God of gods. This is the God of heaven. This is God eternal, the great I am, Jehovah, saying, I am the first and last. Then Isaiah chapter 48 Isaiah chapter 48, verse 12. Isaiah 48, verse 12. Listen to me, Jacob and Israel, the one called by me. I am he. I am the first. I am also the last. And if you, and if, in case you're confused, he goes on in verse 13 and says, My own hand founded the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I summoned them, they stood up together. So this is definitely God the Creator speaking here in these three verses. And so in verse 8, he says to himself, Alpha and Omega, beginning in, Jesus identifies as the first and the last in verse 17. And then in other places in Revelation, it gets brought up again. It's repeated in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. Jesus says that of himself to the church at Ephesus. And again in Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. Now, I don't want to make a big deal about this part because there are some discrepancies you could get into some ideas. If you include the Alpha and Omega statement from verse 8, um, if I'm counting right, and count with me, in verse 8 of the book of Revelation, if you count the Alpha and Omega, that's one, first and last, that's two in verse 17, three, four in those other passages of scriptures in Revelation. Now, and this is in this in this particular translation. Um, it, it doesn't quite work out that way if you um, if you just do uh, if you use the King James because of that passage of scripture in verse eleven. But if you use the passage of scripture in verse eleven, if you're doing King James, knock out that eight with the Alpha and Omega and just use the first and last from verse eleven. But I don't want I don't want to play too many games with this. And this is where I say you don't want to get too caught up with this. There's four times in Revelation that it's said of, of God, of Jesus, first and last, Alpha and Omega. Well, that's not seven, Steve, until you add those three times in Isaiah. And so now you have the completion across the Old Testament and the New. So, again, I tend to lean into that. Now, I'm just telling you, I tend to lean into that. Don't go too heavy into that because you don't want to get off track of what really matters and what is in view, and that is that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, um, that, that we don't want to get away from Jesus for the sake of all these neat little things that are in there. But I also bring this up to say he has testified, God testifies of himself in the book of Isaiah three times, I am the first and the last. Jesus, here this is this is definitively Jesus, there's no... There's no one from any of these other cults that would tell you that's not Jesus saying that of himself. Their, their argument is null and void, that God and Jesus are not one and the same. And so they have to do some real mental gymnastics to get around that, and they even have to change the translation of Scripture as they see it with no foundation for changing the translation of Scripture to get around that. So... Um, it's just one of those things, it's pretty neat to see that Jesus says that of himself, and it is definitively there, even in the manuscripts that we have, that you don't have to go to the Texas Receptus that is there for the King James Version. So 
it's just one of those things that's that's really neat to see from from scripture. Um, so as we uh, as we as we kind of get ready here to we, we're we're kind of running out of time. Um, I want to. Uh, We, we've kind of jumped around here. As I said, we would. We'd be all over the place, and I apologize for that. I just want to point these neat things out to you. Um, but I want to now turn our attention to this this reunion and what we see. Um, turn, Go back to Revelation chapter 1, and let's look together starting in verse 10. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Now, that word, that term, the Lord's Day, this is another one of those academic things. It, it really maybe should better be translated on the day of the Lord, which kind of, it, that has all types of implications to it, but it, it doesn't matter. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and I heard a loud voice behind me like a trumpet saying, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me, and when I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands. And among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, dressed in a long robe and with a gold sash wrapped around his chest. We've read this already. His head and hair were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. He had seven stars in his right hand, A sharp double-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was shining like the sun at midday. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I'm alive forever and and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write what you have seen, what is, and what will take place after this. The secret of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. A couple of things that we want to point out about Jesus, about this reunion. One, obviously Jesus in his voice is something that John would have known, but it seems there's a little bit of difference to it this time, that, that Jesus is, is there in, in the fullness of his glory. This is not a still small voice speaking to Elijah. This is not this is not a man humbly riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. This is not a baby crying out from a manger in Bethlehem. This is not even a man crying out to God the Father from the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the fullness of his glory. And 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 he's not silent. He he's not the lowly Jesus anymore. And I think we should all take comfort in that. I think that that's one of those things that we as believers can rejoice in, that that when Jesus comes again, he is not coming to die. There's going to be no ambiguity about who he is. You go back up to what John said, and and we need to, we probably should have broken this this passage of Scripture down where John says, look, in verse 7, Look, he's coming in, He's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, including those who pierced him. And all the families of the earth will mourn over him. This is certain. Amen. Jesus, there's going to be no ambiguity about who he is. The whole earth will know who is judging the earth. Those who dwell on the earth during the time of judgment will know. And, and, and there's going to be no secret to it. But what's glorious is Jesus says, I died and I rose again. I'm alive, and I'm alive forever and ever. My life has no end. I am the living one, and I hold the keys to death and hell. I control this matter. There's no one. I have authority. I have the sovereignty. I have the power. That's why, as his children, we can say, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? We Grave, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? We can say those things. We can, we can rejoice that, that we don't mourn as those who have no hope, but we have a hope and a risen Savior and a returning Savior. You see, that's the other thing that we see here throughout this first chapter. 
we see not only the first and last, but we see the God who is, who was, and who is to come. We see Jesus, who is the first and last, the living one, who was dead and is alive forever and has the keys to death and hell. We see where Jesus says, write the things that you have seen, the things that are, and the things that are coming after this. We see this idea of, a, of the past, the present, the future handled in God and in Christ. In the same way, you were saved. If you're a believer, you were saved. That means you were saved from the punishment of sin. And, and even now, Paul says we are being saved. That is the idea of sanctification, that in the present, we are still being saved. We are being saved from the power of sin as God empowers us to, to, to have victory over the flesh and sin. We're being saved from the power of sin. And one day, Jesus is coming to remove us from this earth to save us from the presence of sin. I didn't make all that up on my own. I just like it. So it's good stuff. But what we see is a, is a victorious, powerful Savior. And our God is mighty to save. Our, our Jesus, our defender, is a strong fortress. He is, a, he is mighty. He is, he is the God of the universe. But he's also our brother. He's also our friend. He's also... He's just, he's also the gentle Savior. You know, he's our good shepherd. He's all these things. And we can rejoice in, in who he is. And so the other thing I would say is this, and, I, and this is, I think, one of those things, because what we're going to do as we move into chapter 2, as we move into these letters to the churches, we're going to get to what is the most pertinent for us now in, the, in these days. We get hung up on the prophecy aspect of Revelation, and, and there's so many things after the church, like the, the churches take up two chapters, and then after that, we get into all this other stuff where there's all this controversy about what does this mean, what does that mean, and, and we'll talk about our take on things as we move forward and what we believe, and, and I told you last week, there are people who I consider dear friends who disagree with me on these matters. But one thing that is that we can agree on is that as we look to these letters of the churches, they become a guide for how we are to conduct ourselves as the church, even as the world is falling apart. But the glorious thing about being the church, even as the world is falling apart, and even though, you know, there are many preachers and teachers who are who are now saying in our country that oppression is coming, you know, we, we're seeing the shadow of it even now that even should oppression and persecution come on the church here in America, that that doesn't mean we're deserted or left alone. Look where Jesus is. When John turns around, he sees the lampstands, and we find out later the lampstands are the churches. And who is there in the midst of the lampstands? Jesus. And if that's not enough, he says the seven stars are the angels of the church, they're the messengers to the church. And where are they? They're in his hand. So there is comfort and consolation for those messengers to the church, which you know many people would consider to be the pastors or whatever, the leadership, um, and for the layperson of the church. Jesus is in our midst, and he holds us. He has promised to never leave us or forsake us. And we can cling to him in all things. We are to be delivered from the wrath of God that will be poured out on this world. I believe that with my whole heart based on what I read in the scriptures. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to experience tribulation and turmoil and it doesn't mean we're not going to experience suffering. In fact, Jesus said, in this world, you'll have much trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world, and the overcomer is in our midst. We can walk with no fear, in full confidence and assurance of the love of our Savior for us, because he's there with us, and he's holding us in his mighty right hand. 
Next week we'll get into the letters to the churches and and try to um, come back and and clear up any confusion that may come out of this week and me being all over the place with it. Um, it'll be easy to kind of it should have been easy this week to do that, but I got again you get an over you just get over excited about all the information and of course now I'm going to be made fun of for going for an hour talking about this, but um, you had you ain't seen nothing. I mean. I, we can. I could do this for hours, just sitting down here talking into a microphone. Let's have some fun. We won't do that right now. Let's pray, and and uh, and and we'll say goodbye for this time together. Father, we love you, and we are thankful for your blessings on us, and 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 the fact that we serve a Savior who is who is alive, who is well, who is living, who is among us, and who holds us up. Thank you for that. Thank you for the promise of your constant presence. Thank you for the promise of eternity. And thank you, Lord, that you have shown yourself again and again and again through your scriptures to be faithful and true. And that you delight in making and keeping promises and, and that we can trust you with all that we are in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much. Y'all have a blessed week, and we will see you Sunday morning, God willing.